yeah, there's a lot of things happening when it comes to new technology and, uh, and ethics of all those, every, every uh, combination um, term from the left uh, row to the right row gives you a very interesting topic for a paper that I tell my students and uh, they have a go with it and it uh, gives you very interesting. Uh, it's not always clear, it's very confusing actually when you take these concepts that could be taken from the index or a philosophy uh, textbook um, we already have trouble in, uh, in defining them and coming up with a, a coherent account. But when you prefix these terms that are taken from the digital realm, it's becoming even more confusing. And that is very nice for a philosophical discussion, but it's not so very nice when you want to make policies, when you want to design systems, because then you have to know more precisely what you're talking about. So what you're seeing is People are talking about cyber communities and blockchain organizations, or artificial intelligence and digital democracies, but basically they are moving around in a conceptual vacuum, which again is okay in a philosophical discussion, but you have to be more precise when you want to design and change the world uh, in light of these values. And not only have, do you have a conceptual vacuum, but you also have, therefore, a policy vacuum and a design vacuum. Um, so the point I'm going to make is that ethics is importantly about design in the 21st century. If, if we're not going along those lines, uh, it's bound to be ineffective, irrelevant, and it will not be there located where the action is, where people have an opportunity to change things for the better. Um, so it's, uh, it will be designing its own irrelevance. I keep telling my colleagues in philosophy departments. So first you need to understand how values get expressed in design. Uh, this is a classical example. Some of you may have seen this. I know that Dino has seen it, and Dirk has seen it. And this is a paper already from the 80s. Do artifacts have politics? It was published in Davis, the American uh, uh, Academy, published by Langdon and Winner. And the example makes the point very clearly. This is an, an, an overpass that's referred to uh, in common parlance, there's a low hanging over class. It was designed in order to prevent buses from the poor black neighborhoods to be routed to the white middle class features. It was intentionally designed by the architect who made these pieces of infrastructure to be a racist barrier or to be an, an instrument of segregation. So, yes, artifacts do have politics, and once you've seen this example, you will recognize it everywhere. Uh, it's an old idea, uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham. Philosopher was very proud to, to, to come up with this idea. You know, the dome shaped prison, great idea. Uh, you only need one guard to open the whole prison instead of hundreds of people running out corridors and checking upon the inmate mates. So, a very efficient idea. All by a simple idea in architecture, by the soul of so many societal problems. Uh, this is also a very nice example. It's a book that is dedicated to analyzing how civil engineering and water management technology was used in, uh, in, uh, in China uh, to support um, their totalitarian and uh, despotic regimes. And so they had access to that knowledge. They could decide whether the water would flow and that that was a great consequences and therefore uh, they, uh, they were in charge. They could decide. Of course, it came with uh, a specific type of society where you had to have large-scale, massive forced labor and uh, an administration to deal with the slave labor. So the two go hand in hand and developed uh, over the course of time. So we have these kind of examples, you know, uh, models and uh, algorithms uh, shaping the, the fate of, of the financial world. We know this, of course, you know better than I, algorithms and news feeds. And we have, uh, this is the centennial light bulb. We can make light bulbs that burn for 100 years, but of course, they are designed for contrived durability. We want people to buy more of that stuff uh, every, uh, every other uh, month. Uh, Planned obsolescence, searches in uh, Google for why is my iPhone so slow, coincide with the release of these light bulbs. So that's. Why you die today? Sorry. Are you tired of We can design for addiction. You get a PhD uh, in designing websites in such a way that they will be more addictive and have uh, young people glued to them. Uh, you can have hostile architecture. Uh, so if you don't want people chasing uh, sleeping uh, beggars, obviously, uh, you can design it this way. 
Uh, and we, of course, we are designing the cities from scratch. Everything you see there is designed, uh, and will have, as Churchill said, carry the values and have them edited and express the values of the people who are designing that. We shape our buildings and thereafter our buildings shape us. We inherit the properties, the value dimensions that we have designed in. They will come to effect us later on. So if you look at digital technology and information systems at every level, uh, decisions are made and you're confronted by a system uh, that is the solidified, consolidated set of choices that have been made, some of them very trivial, some of them very important, that may affect our lives and the options that are open to us, like the low-hanging over past that has racist and segregation uh, consequences. So this idea can and must be used responsibly, it must be used systematically, and it must be used agile, in an agile way, continuously. And how does it work? Um, so we have uh, we have worked on this for a couple of years in uh, in Delft, and it's a, it's a kind of a, 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 there are more hubs around the world that, that uh, engage in this kind of research. Um, and uh, the kind of the, the format is this: on the one hand, on the left hand side, you have ethical considerations, so values, uh, responsibility, privacy, whatever. And on the other hand, you have the world of engineering and technology, and you want not the racist ideas to be expressed on the right hand side, you want the things that we share, the values that we are in agreement about, share, to be expressed in the world of technology and engineering. And once we have done that, and we have sunk a lot of our taxpayers' money into it, we want to be able to explain and justify that we have done the right thing. Now, this is a very crude uh, scheme. Uh, and we can be, made, be more precise because we need to, because we have to be able to design and demonstrate that we have done a good job. So this is a book that we've done with a lot of examples of how this can be carried out. Um, also with uh, an overview of the best methodologies that are around. So designing for X and X ranges of your pet value. Uh, could be privacy, security, inclusion, sustainability, etc. We have examples from all of those bodies of literature. And it's, and, it's, and it's already happening, uh, I'm happy to, to, to say. And uh, so with students and in our teaching and also in our research, we do these kind of things. We start at a very high level of abstraction uh, with something uh, like privacy or democracy or accountability. Um, and we all seem to know what we mean by that. But once we sit down and try to make explicit uh, what we precisely mean by that and how the the system should be designed, it's, it's, it turns out to be very difficult. So you have to uh, come down and functionally decompose these high level super functional requirements. These are moral requirements. And this is a little bit of the slave of hand that we, that, we, uh, that we use. We conceive of moral values as some sort of constraint. And once you have conceived of them, construed of them as a constraint, you can insert them in a list of, of constraints and requirements that engineers are very used to working with. So then, then you're from. So it's a so it's a requirement, um, and you make them more specific: norms, policies, mechanisms, and protocols, until they issue a design requirement. So we use these kind of value trees: privacy, what do you mean? Well, risk mitigation, uh, uh, security, what do you mean? Risk mitigation, force training data, uh, pseudonymization, whatever. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a huge advantage because now you can point your laser pointer to somewhere where you disagree. The ego says, well, I, I disagree with this. It gives a lot of traction and structure to your moral arguments, which you hadn't before. Otherwise, you were kind of jumping from one yellow world of ethics to another world of the engineering with no means to connect the two. So this is a way to connect the two worlds of engineering and ethics. And um, it, it, it works. We do a lot of that stuff, we publish a lot of it. Um, and it can be fairly detailed. Um, so we are bringing in the mix uh, technology, the conceptual analysis of these high level concepts, and some empirical research whether you know, our assumptions were right, whether this is really helping uh, you know, to, to increase accountability as we have defined it. So we have to do empirical research. And we have to do that time and again. So for the first time in the history of ethics, we have 
um, we have a little bit of an empirical cycle. Of course, one of the methodological infirmities is why in the School of Legal Ethics is we don't have data. So it's no longer the Bible, it's no longer uh, Immanuel Kant or John Stuart Mill. Uh, so how do we help ourselves with data? In this way, through technology, you get an empirical research, you get some data points that, that you could use to pull yourself out of, uh, out of the marsh. So you have you start with the high level concept as equality, you explicate it into democracy, you specify it further, okay, so that deliberation is going to be part of, of that. You decompose it in what group deliberation of life look like, and you, you do some empirical stuff, and you see whether the results uh, are to your liking. And so you repeat that over and over again, and you tweak that. Um, and if we do not do this systematically, uh, uh, then others will do it for us. And they will do it secretly, they, they will do it haphazardly, and they will do it self serving So this is important that we learn to do it. So what is the value? Um, I have um, um, promised a, uh, a report for the best essay on what the hell is the value for the students, for PhD students. Uh, that's still uh, used as a, as a primitive term. But this is certainly true. I think that if you if you are committed to a particular value, it's going to be deliberation, uh, <clears throat> deliberation, consequential. If you're going to have a discussion on democracy or on accountability, you, you are you are supposed to use that as a, a significant tool. Uh, and in parallel, you would suggest the same hope for these. <clears throat> Now, we're not the only ones who um, think along those lines. <clears throat> uh, Paul Nimitz, who is the architect of the GPR, also thought that design would be the way to go. Um, everyone is interested in ethics, he said, uh, as long as it's not wrong. Um, and he emphatically uh, said, uh, if we're going to protect our Western, open, liberal democracies, uh, and the same uh, remark was made by the, uh, <coughs> the European Data Protection Service, which uh, already, in a paper that he, uh, he helped to, uh, to call uh, digital ethics should be done by design. <coughs> now, this all sounds very wonderful, um, but there are so many values, and I already have slides full of them, all of those values, and we want to take them seriously, and we need to take them seriously. So how do we deal with value pluralism, which is an essential ingredient for our democracy? Um, and there are many, and we cannot show selectively from this list of values. We cannot say, well, today we'll do human dignity, tomorrow we'll do safety, and uh, next week we'll do sustainability. We'll have to do all of these things at the same time. We're bound to have conflicts and dilemmas, trade-offs, and second best. Uh, so how do we deal with them? We are overloaded. Call this phenomenon moral overload. So it weighs very heavy on our shoulders. We need to take care of all of these things at the same time. They burden us. So we have to think about jobs and about prosperity and sustainability, about safety and security, about uh, efficiency and safety, accountability and confidentiality. And this is a case where it didn't work. This is a very sustainable bus, but it's not safe. You know, it's light materials, liquid gas, blew up, not a good idea. Um, uh, we had some nasty stories in the Netherlands. Uh, from a patient safety point of view, very good idea to have a nationwide patient register system, also from certain in, in terms of our cost reduction. But we didn't think about the privacy at an early stage. So wasted in innovation because we didn't think about the privacy. It was rejected in the upper house. It was a no-brainer from from all of these other value perspectives, but the privacy was not taken care of. If that would have designed in at an early stage, then we wouldn't have had this failure. But this, this, this requires you to think at an early stage in terms explicitly and systematically, in terms of those values and these ethical considerations, you have to have them on the table. Same thing with the smart meters. You know, from a sustainability point of view, a no-brainer. You had to smartify the, uh, the electricity grid to peak shade and load balancing and every temperature in every household with a smart node. 
Uh, and, but again, rejecting the Opera House because the privacy was not designed in right from the start. Um, so this is the structure of the problem. You want your sustainability and you want your privacy, or you want your privacy and you want your security in the street. Uh, these are all things that are binding, these are obligations that you have, societal obligations or moral obligations. Um, and this is a principle that was formulated in logic, deontic logic. If there is an obligation to do A and B, then you have a second order obligation to see to it that you can do A and B. Um, with a little footnote about that, the second order obligation is slightly weaker than the first one. Um, so, if I had an obligation to rescue Dirk, and if I have an obligation to rescue Dino, right, and I'm standing here, and it's easy for me to rescue you, but unfortunately not you, uh, then uh, these two obligations are binding. These are real obligations that I have. And uh, I should think about a way of changing the world in such a way that I can now satisfy both of those, those obligations. There is no guarantee that there is such a silver bullet. But if the stakes are high enough, and Dear's life is very precious to me and to all of us, uh, so I have to think of something clever. I have to think of a smart move of standing here and picking up a stick and reaching out to here. So that is the, is, is the clever idea, is the innovation. I'm changing the world so that I can satisfy more of my obligations. So this is this is this is what 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 something is possible if you think explicitly at an early stage about these values. So <clears throat> if you can change the world by innovation today so that you can change to satisfy more of your obligations tomorrow, you have a moral obligation to innovate today. That's the excellent. So ethics by design, and this is also operative, we had an opportunity to, have, to mention it on the dinner last night, this is the famous trolley case, where if you teach this to engineers, it's probably the same experience here in the uh, if you would do that, uh, some of you may have uh, tried it, um, is that the Dell students, uh, engineers, mechanical engineers, or railway designers say, well, you know, this is all, this is all very nice, but it's, it's a, this is a bad design, because we should, Instead of taking off into uh, into the atmosphere and, and, and procrastinate and, and think about ethics for, for quite some time, we should think of ways to redesign this. The poor guy at the switch is a victim of a bad design. He has this dilemma because other people were not thinking how they could prevent this dilemma from occurring. So, of course, in the philosophy seminar, this is no go area. But for engineers, this is really uh, an interesting, and I think it's pointing in the direction of where we should be thinking uh, in the 21st century when it comes to technology. Try to prevent uh, accidents from happening and try also to prevent dilemmas from occurring. Try to come up with, with designs that will allow you to satisfy more of your moral obligations that you could have, than you could have without that innovation. Can all problems be solved this way? No, but some very important ones can. And uh, so if you want to count these people, uh, you can do it this way. This is a very simple example of uh, technologies that Dino is, is, is working with, and probably some of you also. This is course grading the data. And so it allows you to count the number of, supposing for the sake of argument that it is important to count how many people are in the room, uh, but without giving away their privacy. So now some of you, I can do two things of the things that I, I needed to do, uh, and I have amplified, expanded the set of moral obligations that I can satisfy. And there are more examples from the research that is done in PISA that we're doing also in context though. And these are, um, some of my colleague philosophers would say, technical fixes. I think that these are very interesting contributions to changing the world for the better. Right, because you're expanding the set of moral obligations that you can satisfy. All of these things, right? And even uh, ex post facto, you know, afterwards. So, um, in uh, our, this is kind of a bibliometrical study that we did, uh, looking for digital ethics in the web of science. Um, and uh, so it's a time, uh, time lapse 
So you see that all these papers, but when you look for digital ethics in the world of science, they're in health. So it all started with patient records and medical data, privacy. And then gradually, it's, it's moving to uh, humanities, into law, into business. And the most re recent activity is here. This is computer science. So if you're now looking for digital ethics, all of that stuff is happening in computer science. So this is further to my point that a lot of the interesting contributions that are made are made in a fairly technical way because that's the only way you can shape the world because that is where the action is. This is where the rubber hits the road. We have to bridge those two worlds of ethics, which is very abstract, it's going nowhere, you have to relate it uh, to, uh, to the world of engineering. So there are many examples I can give, I'll go through them very quickly because we're running out of time. So same thing, it's an ethical phone, the Dutch fair phone, and those will later to refer to societal or ethical requirements. The, the phone strikes us as very smart, it's a very nice innovation because it allows you to accommodate six of those things in one design, in one felt spoon. That is really awesome. Uh, so this is stuff that we use, the, the colleagues in Delta are doing. So it's nanoprinted uh, uh, material uh, replacement. So it has three things that you desperately want. Uh, more bone tissue regenerated, uh, blood vessels, and killing the bacteria at the site of the surgery. Uh, same thing here. You're trying to expand the things that you really desperately want to achieve. And further, and further. So that's uh, battery of the future. So that's smart fusion of conflicting values in design. You can also do this, of course, by deception. Now you have two requirements, moral or societal requirements, on the table, and you pretend that you have solved it, yet you have found this wonderful combination, right? which is further evidence to the pattern that is on the right here, because it's using it. It's using this pattern, it's suggesting that it's to achieve this, but it has not. So designing for democracy only five minutes. Well, an epistemic, uh, well, I have five minutes more because dear took too long to, 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 to introduce. So uh, two fundamental ways of looking at, uh, at, uh, at democracy, uh, an epistemic and a moral uh, spread. So this is work that, that, uh, that Dirk has also done, look at it as a, an epistemic or a way of, of mobilizing collective intelligence to arrive at smart solutions to our collective problems. And Dewey is a good example of someone who has already advocated that 100 years ago. Uh, and this kind of stuff, uh, and that kind of stuff you're familiar with. But it all is premised on the idea that you can decide and say something more about the truth conditions of, of, the, uh, of the individual jurors' uh, opinions. And there's a deep concern of, for getting it right, at least not getting it wrong. And that is a, that's a huge problem because uh, many people have uh, suggested that we are in an epistemic crisis, and I think we are. If you, if you look at these, uh, you know, we have merchants of data, we have influencers of networks, we have lobbyists, we have profit maximizing and managing reach, we have conspiracy engineers, read this book by Rosenblum, uh, and the digital technologies have all helped them out. They have support, given them a hand. So, um, Jokai Bengler has said it's an epistemic crisis and it's very much helped by digital technologies, but it's not only the technology. It's a, it's a feature of the culture. Uh, so these are the virtues of doubt. Uh, this is Harry Frankfurt on bullshit. Uh, we're seeing a lot of bullshit, and the characteristic of a bullshitter is, is that he's not even interested in the truth. A liar or a deceiver is interested in the truth because he has to always systematically said the opposite of what he thinks is true, right? So he's still guided in a devious way by the truth, but the bullshit just doesn't care. Now we seem to move to be moving into a, a culture of bullshit where people just have given up on tracking the truth or being guided or oriented by the truth. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is a very interesting group on new conspiracy theory, and the claim of that group is that uh, in the old days we had even better conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so this the epistemic crisis is a very big problem for the standard conception of democracy that you find, for example, in this wonderful book by Amartya Sen on the idea of justice, where he says, well, it is the best expression of, of 
our idea of public reason and deliberation, uh, democracy is governed by discussion. Um, and therefore, the media are so important. So these are all premises and assumptions under this idea, but no longer true, no longer satisfied. So that whole body of literature that is talking about democracy as you know the art of conversation, as expressing our conceptions of public reason, uh, no longer help because the discussion that is referred to here is truth oriented, it's inclusive, extensive, and sustained, and institutionally embedded and supported. No longer true. Right? We're, we're in place with these people. So that's, uh, uh, and, and squirrel lying in front of your garden may be more relevant uh, than your interest, uh, relevant to your interest right now than people dying in Africa. So it leaves us with the moral conceptions, and there is a big threat to the moral conceptions. So there was, there's a, a parallel argument. So the epistemic crisis that we're is a big threat to the epistemic conception of democracy, and we need to work very hard on how to design economic mechanisms to make that fly. So we have to do work on, you know, the jurors need to be independent, otherwise it doesn't work, etc. Um, but for the moral conception, there's a huge problem with respect to uh, equal freedom, opportunity, dignity, and respect. It has to do with the nature of the new digital technologies. Um, big data and AI provide new and obfuscated affordances for inequity and discrimination. And that is, of course, chipping away at the roots of this core idea of free and equal citizens. Uh, and, you know, affordance is this inviting characteristic of the technology. It, it, it just invites you to make use of it in a particular way. Uh, so we see it everywhere. We see uh, discrimination, we see the uh, listing and, and creation of characteristics in a, in a sometimes arbitrary way, and they're going to, and they're being used. This is my time. Uh, so we know all of these these problems, and even as far as Dirk has also referred to it, we see it being used in in healthcare and in terminal care, where algorithms and artificial intelligence are used to just to you know, to look at the bad risks and ignore them if it's too costly. Uh, uh, or crowdsourcing our ethics, you know, or machine in MIT, uh, where there's a huge database sitting, uh, and uh, it's, it suggests that this is the, the final story about how we should solve those ethical dilemmas. Uh, but are they morally relevant? That is an open question, and it cannot just be decided by consulting <laughs> MIT's database. It's something that we independently need to think about and discuss amongst each other. Um, so what makes us equal? It's still the case that in this moral conception of democracy, uh, there's this assumption of basic equality, uh, and that there are no discontinuities in the range of humanity that would afford some humans a lower status than others. This is the idea of single status societies. We have not yet given up on this idea of the of caste. Um, and this is expressed uh, in, uh, in the work of John Rawls, a Harvard political philosopher, that says, who says, we have to decide behind the veil of ignorance. We have to decide about the design and the mechanisms in society, uh, not knowing or not factoring in uh, who we will be in those societies. We cannot just tailor make the principles to that we know that we will be intelligent, that we will be male, that we will be Christian, that we will be... No, we cannot know all of these things. We need, to, we need to design and think about these rules and principles independent of who we are going to be in that society. So, a just society is a society that if you knew everything about it, you would be willing to enter in a random place. And so, this also applies to the design of these kind of systems that we played around with that idea in the paper uh, here in, in your novel also did. Uh, so think about this situation. You could be everywhere. Uh, and that's quite opposite from this because this is trying to get as much information on all of these people and trying to to find you know policies and come up with policies based on the individual characteristics and attributes of these people. And of course that is the affordance of the technology. The data are there, the machine learning is there, we can we can actually know so much. And the idea is that by knowing 
much more about it, we can come up with more clever solutions. But it's, it's exactly the opposite of what uh, a conception of justice in the design for a just society a la Rawls would suggest. Um, so, this is just to close off. Um, if we're thinking about, about uh, uh, democracy, we need to do some, some really hard work, some detailed work. We have to think about which kind of conceptions of democracy are we working with? What do they entail? Uh, what kind of instruments do we need to build? Are they working in the way that we, we think that they will be working? So uh, that is uh, so. If, if we're, we're going for a contestatory democracy, then we have to provide information and, and means of contestation to citizens. If it's if it's wisdom of the crowds, we have to design for independence and many many more things. So that's what we need to do. Uh, there was a report of the Dutch uh, Council for Public Administration that uh, came up with a number of, of suggestions. We provided input to to that as well. Invest in public pursuit of truth. Uh, facilitate fact-checking practices by epistemic and traditional institutions like universities, media, libraries, and NGOs. Use deliberation as a design principle for public platforms. Create public platforms that design for public values. Um, so we've done some, some work. Uh, this is a really work of a PhD student who dealt uh, on uh, filter models. Uh, and now we're working, uh, hopefully also with some people here, on massive open online deliberation platforms. That is, platforms like Wikipedia, not for facts, but for opinions that are the same properties that are reliable, and, and all the problems that we can think about, we can turn into design problems, and we can design against them or for them. So this is, I think, what we need to do, and uh, that, that's, uh, that's a lot of work. There's a lot at stake because the battle is going on, uh, and the question, of course, is where Europe is going. Uh, is it uh, going to be the museum of the world, or is it going to be the cradle of the Enlightenment 2.0? Well, hopefully it's, uh, it's the latter, and uh, I think we need to uh, join forces to, uh, to make it happen.